I am delighted to be here for the announcement of a rather important report called Overturning Convictions and an Era. It's actually a title that came out of a newspaper article, but it cuts to the heart of it which is that the work of the Philadelphia District Attorney's Conviction Integrity Unit, which is historic and which is an incredible achievement, especially compared to what happened in prior administrations, is not just about the many people who were innocent and who are now out of jail as a result of the CIU's work. It's about <clears throat> the restoration of trust between communi communities that have good reason not to trust prosecutors and have good reason not to trust police. It's about that. It's about a criminal justice system that for decades put winning cases first and put the truth second that for decades put politics first and justice second, and that for decades, sadly with the assistance of a lot of people in the media, wanted to tell the same dehumanizing story over and over that ignored the evidence and ignored the facts and ignored the science and ignored the truth hmm. and also ignored the United States Constitution, which required prosecutors to do better and required police to do better. And that's not what happened. So we are here to talk about this amazing report. I want to acknowledge some of the people who prepared this report and did the work that is memorialized in this report. We have prosecutors and staff from Philadelphia's Conviction Integrity Unit with us. They are standing here. This is their work uh, in no particular order. They are Michael Garmisa, Andrew Welbrock, Tom Gaita, Sarah Boyette, Banafsha Amirzada, Arlen Caton, Jessica Addy, Leandra Ritako, Graham Sternberg, Rebecca McDonald, Jonathan Eubank, Samantha Bass, Eleanor Carpenter, then known as Vince Habib Wahir Abdul. Habib Wahir Abdul, then known as Vincent Jenkins, was convicted of rape in 1983 and spent 16 years in prison before he was exonerated. In May 1982, a young woman was raped in a nature preserve in Buffalo, New York. The victim described the assailant as a black man between 5 feet 8 and 5 feet 10 inches with a space between his upper front teeth who was wearing a hooded jacket. He had blindfolded her during the assault. Investigation and trial Though Abdul did not fit the description, he was 6 feet 2 and did not have a gap in his teeth. He was picked up over 4 months after the assault. The victim had been informed by police that Abdul was the suspect but she failed initially to identify him as her assailant. The victim then viewed a photo of Abdul that was four years old and eventually identified him as the perpetrator during a show-up procedure. A forensic analyst testified at Abdul's trial that he compared hairs from the crime scene with Abdul's hairs and found them to be distinctively different. He said he couldn't exclude Abdul as a possible perpetrator, however, because it's not unusual to have different hairs come from the same... Kenneth Adams. In 1978, Kenneth Adams, along with three other men who are collectively now known as the Ford Heights Four, was wrongly convicted of rape and double homicide. Adams was sentenced to 75 years in prison. It took 18 years for DNA testing to exonerate him. In May 1978, a recently engaged couple was abducted from a filling station close to where the man worked. The bodies of the couple were found the next day in an abandoned townhouse in East Chicago Heights now Ford Heights. Both victims had been shot, and the female victim had been gang-raped. Investigation and Trial A false tip from a man who lived near the crime scene lead to the arrest of four men, Verniel Jimerson, Dennis Williams, Adams, and Willie Range. In addition, Paula Gray, 
Adam's girlfriend who could neither read nor write, was brought into the police station for questioning. After being held without legal counsel for a couple of days, Gray confessed to a grand jury that she had been present while the four men had raped the female victim. She also stated that she saw Dennis Williams shoot both victims. A month later, Gray recanted her story at a preliminary hearing, stating that she had been drugged and police had simply told her what to say. The charges against Jimerson were dropped, uh -huh. but Gray was then charged with murder and perjury. Post-conviction investigation In 1994, the jailhouse informant recanted his testimony, stating that he had lied about overhearing Williams and Range discussing how they committed the murder because prosecutors offered him a deal on the charges he was facing at the time. Uh -huh. With the help of David Prudis, Rob Warden, and a team of journalism students from Northwestern University, the four men gained access to evidence for DNA testing. In 1996, DNA testing exonerated all four men and implicated three other men, two of whom confessed and pleaded guilty to the crimes in 1997. They also discovered that the police had been tipped to the identity of the actual perpetrators early on in the investigation, but did not pursue the lead. Life after exoneration Okay. Uh, he, this man here, he Kenneth, he received um, like uh, I think they did a total of thirty-six million against the police officers that was involved in the investigation. So y'all see how everybody feel like um, the feds, um, um, investigators, the police, um, the DA are just you know walking around with a with a halo over their heads and this here shows you guys that this can happen and it has happened over and over and over again and so um it's a sad situation a sad situation um and so you know the innocent project the majority of this here is falsely accused of rape and um it's sad so let's hear this one malcolm alexander ineffective trial lawyer and flawed eyewitness identification procedure destroyed the lives of malcolm alexander and his family for 38 years he is the innocence project's longest serving exonerated client on january 30th 2018 after a reinvestigation by the Jefferson Parish District Attorney's Office, District Court Judge dismissed the indictment and ordered the release of Malcolm Alexander who wrongly served nearly 38 years for a rape that DNA Aye. evidence proves he didn't commit. He was arrested for the 1979 crime based on a deeply flawed, unreliable identification procedure. His paid lawyer who was subsequently disbarred after complaints of neglect and abandonment were filed against him in connection with dozens of other cases failed in his most basic duties to present a defense. I'm Alexander like was subsequently released from the Jefferson Parish Jail. Alexander has always maintained his innocence of the November 8, 1979, rape of the owner of a new antique store on Whitney Avenue in Gretna, Louisiana. The victim, who was white, was grabbed from behind in the empty store by a black man and taken to a small, dark, private bathroom in the back of the store where she was raped from behind with a gun to her head. In February 1980, Alexander, who is black, had a consensual encounter with a white woman who asked him for money and then later accused him of sexual assault. Hmm. This encounter, which was uncorroborated and later dropped by the police, prompted police to place Alexander's photo in a photo array that was shown to the victim over four months after she was attacked at gunpoint by a complete stranger. Wow. The assailant was behind the victim for the entirety of the crime, and her opportunity to view him was extremely limited. According to police reports, the victim tentatively selected Alexander's photo. Research has shown that multiple identification procedures can contaminate a witness's memory, causing a witness to become confused about whether he or she recognizes the person from the event or the earlier procedure while also making the witness more confident in his or her identification. Yet, police conducted a physical lineup three days later that included Alexander. Alexander was the only person from the photo array who was shown again to the victim in the physical lineup. The lead detective on the case was not available to conduct the lineup, so another detective conducted the procedure. According to the report of the lineup, the victim made a possible identification and the word tentative was written next to Alexander's lineup number. However, when the original detective returned later that day and took a statement from the victim, 
the victim's confidence was recorded as 98% sure that Alexander was the assailant, and by the time she got to trial she testified that she had no doubt that he was the assailant. Blood type testing of the rape kit was available at the time that could have either supported the victim's identification or proven that Alexander wasn't the perpetrator but was never sought. A review of the trial record reveals that Alexander's attorney failed to make court appearances and to file important pleadings, including a motion challenging the identification. A review of the one-day trial transcript reveals that the attorney, who was subsequently disbarred, failed to make an opening statement, did not call any witnesses for the defense, failed to adequately cross-examine the state's witnesses about the identification and presented a closing argument that was a mere four pages of the 87-page transcript. Alexander received a life sentence for the guilty verdict. Although the attorney promised to file an appeal of the verdict, he never filed it. Wow. That sound like Greenberg. That sound like Greenberg to me. I'm sorry. <laughs> it really does. Let's, let's check out another one um, from the Innocent Project. Um, I actually um, went in and I, this man here, poor thing, Malcolm served 38 freaking years. You have somebody time served 30 years, 20 years, um, 29 years, 28 years, 12 years, 18 years, 16 years, 22 years. Um, and that's sad, 25, 14, 26, 10. I think this um, young guy here was um, a child at the time. A rape and murder that gave him um, 85 years um, and he was yes this this is the one he was 14 years old Jonathan Barr time served 14 years the crime in the afternoon of November 19th 1991 14 year old Kate Risa Matthews left her great-grandmother's house in Dix Moore Illinois and was not seen again until December 8th 1991 when her body was discovered on a well-worn path running along I-57 as it passes through Dixmoor. She had been shot in the mouth at close range with a .25 caliber pistol. She was also an obvious victim of sexual assault, as her body was naked from the waist down. A pair of white panties was found around her right ankle, and her jeans were draped across her chest. Seminal fluid was recovered from the vaginal and rectal swab of the victim. The Investigation the police made no arrests and seemingly had no leads in the case for over 10 months, until October 20, 1992. On that date, a police report indicated that Kino Barnes, 15, allegedly informed the police that Jonathan Barr had told him that when he last saw Kate Risa, she was getting into a car occupied by Robert Lee Veal and Robert Taylor. At the time of the crime, Barr, Veal, and Taylor were 14 years old. On October 29, 1992, police brought Veal, 15, in for questioning. After more than five hours in police custody, where he was interrogated outside the presence of his parents or counsel, Veal signed a handwritten statement, implicating himself, Jonathan Barr, 15, Robert Taylor, 15, Shane Sharp, 17, and James Harden, 17, in the gang rape and murder of Matthews. Later that day, Robert Taylor signed a handwritten statement, again outside the presence of his parents or counsel, implicating himself and the other four teenagers in the crime. On October 31st, after more than 21 hours in police custody, Shane Sharp also signed a handwritten statement implicating himself and the other four teenagers in the crime. The three confessions contradicted each other on the basic facts of the case. In June 1994, before any of the teenagers were tried, the Illinois State Police Crime Lab identified a lone male DNA profile from sperm recovered from the victim's body. Even though all five defendants were excluded as a source of the semen, the prosecution pushed forward rather than seeking the source of the semen recovered from the victim's body. Okay, I'm going to pause it right there. Now, and you already know me, you know I'm going to have to bring up um, Robert Sylvester Kelly's case. So, we have them with African American young teenage boys who they, they, it was like a um, he say, he say type situation. And because these people said that they were a 14 year old driving a car, pull up a 14 year old and a 15 year old pull up in a vehicle and this um, teenager gets in a car with them. 
And so now we have these um, terrified young um, African American men in um, interrogation. So they're interrogating them. You, it's no telling what else they're doing to them. They're scared, and um, they didn't call the parents. And you know, then sometimes you got parents that when they when stuff like this happened back then, they didn't know any better. You have there's not trying to you know know any better now. But when um, I listened to Jim Derrigatis, and I listened to the so-called expert on um um the lifetime um shenanigans you hear them say um oh they're young cortex to the brain and you know and stuff like that so you know i'm, I'm gonna go another route with this as well so um we got these people you know speaking on oh you know Jer jim Derek um gaddis oh she just it's just like a a, a, a 14 year old sneaking into the movies to watch an X rated movie, this all, you know, she didn't break a crime. And then, you know, so when it comes down to African American um, men, it's, it's totally different. It's like no cortex to the brain or, oh, they don't know any better. And, oh, you know, nothing like that. Like, we're going to get them. We don't care. We're going to try them as an adult. And so, this is the reason why i am doing showing you guys this i want to show you guys that um not only we should um uh, believe the accusers we should also believe the accused and i'm dedicating this to um, one of my clients that swears to the bible that when a woman say something she's telling the truth all the time and so I can I'll tell you a little bit about about her background. She has no no children. She's not married. Um, not a lot of males in her family. She has one nephew. You know, so it's always the woman, the woman, the woman. So I'm like, okay, and I have to argue with her all the time. I said yes. I said we do need to um, believe the accusers i said but also we have to believe the accused until everything comes forward i said do you know how many people are in jail because of a lie you know how many people are in jail false identification um we have um the the experts not doing their job right uh we have you know retaliation and revenge because they're mad at a person and they want only them and they want the attention and you know all these different things you have to take in consideration you know you can't just say oh she's she identified him and we're going to go with that we have to also realize that a person can have consensual sex and then that man or that woman can can leave and go on about their normal life and then this person is calling them and and trying to you know get in contact with them and they're furious oh i had sex with this person because i felt like we were going to be in a relationship so you have a lot of people do stuff out of um anger and revenge and retaliation uh, and, and a lot of women do it for money and so like i said i am trying to do this the in the best way i know how without being you know without scrutinizing anyone but at the same time there has to be some change in these laws we have to have change in these laws now we have um um some people speaking on you know not ch charging the accused um for lying the accuser for, for for lying on the accused because if they give them a harsher punishment for all the people that's in jail uh it might push them back from not coming forward because it's gonna be like oh i let them rot in jail before i rot in jail and so we have to figure this out like we just snatch this person up and then we really have a rapist and a killer out there 
we just grab somebody just to say we prosecuted someone. We got them to make the um, victim happy, the accused are happy. So we just gonna go ahead and do that. And then we have a, probably a psycho running around raping people, you know, killing people and not getting the wrong person off the streets and to see what's going on with them mentally. But we just gonna grab someone. And see, those are the things that I want to talk about because I can go on and on and on. And so, you guys, I have um, donated to the um, Innocent Project because I feel like they have done a great job. I have I've been reading these stories. You can see so many people. You hit, you see black, you see white, um, even um, you know females. But the majority of the people you see are African American men. The high percentage is African American men. All you have to do is um, be black. Now you have a guy that has been was wrongfully convicted. Because a freaking gap in his mouth. A gap. How many black people got gaps in their mouth? Um, I think this is him. I'm going to see. Gaps in his mouth. I'm, I'm, I'm going to see if this is the one. Let me check. This Stephen thing. Cowens. On February 2nd, 2004, Stephen Cowens became the 141st person in the United States to be exonerated as a result of post-conviction DNA testing. On January 23, 2004, having proclaimed his innocence for over five and a half years, Cowens walked out of the Suffolk Superior Court in Boston, Massachusetts. He was officially exonerated at a hearing on February 2, 2004. On May 30, 1997, an officer of the Boston Police Department was shot twice with his own service weapon in the backyard oh, right. of a house in Jamaica Plain following so a short struggle it. with an unknown assailant. The assailant fired an additional shot at an individual who was standing in the window of a second floor bedroom. The assailant ran from the scene, leaving the baseball hat he was wearing. He forcibly entered a nearby home, where he stopped to drink from a glass of water. The assailant then fled, leaving both the gun and the sweatshirt he had been wearing. Approximately two weeks later, the injured police officer identified Stefan Cowens from a photo array composed of eight photographs. Mm. On July 2nd, 1997, the officer attended a lineup and once again singled out Cowens as the man who had shot him. On that same day, the individual who had been watching from the second floor bedroom window also identified Cowens as the assailant. The family who had been present in the home that the assailant had forcibly entered, and who had spent the most time with the assailant, did not identify Mr. Cowens from the lineup. At trial, the Commonwealth used these identifications to convict Cowens. The Commonwealth also relied upon a latent fingerprint that had been found on the glass mug used by the assailant. Prosecutors presented expert testimony asserting that the latent fingerprint matched Cowens's left thumbprint. On May 22, 2003, the Suffolk Superior Court issued an order approving a stipulation entered into between the Innocence Project, Cowens's counsel, and the Commonwealth for the release of the glass mug, swabs taken from the mug, a baseball hat, and the white sweatshirt for the purposes of DNA testing. The tests revealed conclusive results. The primary profile located on the baseball hat matched the profile located on the swab taken from the rim of the glass mug used by the perpetrator. Stefan Cowens was excluded as the source of the DNA on these items. In January 2004, the Commonwealth requested that the white sweatshirt worn by the assailant also be submitted for DNA testing. The results revealed the same profile found on the baseball hat and the swab of the glass mug, and once again did not match the DNA profile of Cowens. After reviewing the DNA test results, the Suffolk County District Attorney reanalyzed the fingerprint that had been used to convict Cowens. This re-examination showed that the fingerprint did not actually belong to Cowens. You see that mess? You see, I, I mean, I can go on, on. I just don't want to do it because I, y'all know me. Mm. But I, I was trying to, I found this fascinating. I, I don't know which one it was. I thought it was him, um, Stefan. But you see that the damn police, the damn police identified this man, this black man. You got big lips, big nose, big gap. Uh, you know, uh, you, you, you're black. Hell, you did it, shit. You did it. You know, and so. That's the kind of, um, you know, um, bull crap that I am talking about. 
And so um, I, I, I find it like really, really hard um, to believe that they would do some stuff like that just to um, get a conviction. And so I want to share, and I and I donated um, to the um, Innocent Project, and I'm going to continue to. Um, this is what I did too, because I ordered a shirt because I wanted to donate. But then I donated ten dollars while I was purchasing the shirt. So, but I also want to um, donate some money towards um, the Innocent Project because they have like so much. Um, to offer um, here. So in the Innocent Project, like they have um, like volunteer um, attorneys, experts, you know, all type, you know, everything that you need to help you um, be acquitted. And so um, they have a big team. It, it, it's, it's, it's wonderful, you know, that you can go ahead and um, you know, um, have somebody, you know, to help you, you know, fight your case. And also your attorneys, um, you, they have attorneys that just don't give a damn. They don't give a damn. Then, you know, even like the FBI was, um, listening to some stuff about the, um, FBI. Um, they did a raid, um, $86 million in cash and a million more in jewelry and, and other valuable stuff um, they seized. And so they was trying to keep it, but they didn't have a warrant for it. And they still tried to, you know, try to keep it. And, you know, the judge was like, no, um, we're going to give um, this money back to these people. And so um, actually it was a, a company that owned a boat um, where you can lock up, you know, certain things. So they feel like, you know, the feds felt like, oh, they're just a, um, a place where they can hide stuff so they won't have to pay taxes. It's all about the money, you know, all the time. Every It seems like it's always about jealousy and money and, you know, and things like that. So um, they talked about the, the Fifth Amendment, you know, um, the, the well, the Fourth um, Amendment, you know, and stuff, you know, that law. They brought up that law, you know, telling the FBI, no, you're not going to get these people money. So they trying to hold on. They get stuff. They seize it. Um, and, and, and do a whole lot of stuff, you know, um, illegally. So it is good to try to understand the law, um, understand um, that, that you know, the feds um, and police also can break the law. They are human beings as well. And so we, we need to do what we need to do to try to um, um, better these laws and better how they handle um, situations so um, we can you know make it fair for everyone you know for the accusers and the accused All you did was get rich, I just walk around.